But I want to thank everyone for being here. And the reason we did this conference tonight is we've got a lot of feedback from our advisors, a lot of questions about the upcoming election, a lot of questions about depending on what party controls the Senate and the House, uh, depending on what candidate gets into office, what does that mean for the market or the proactive moves you should be making right now? And you know, Bob and I are going to come at this tonight from the most apolitical perspective we possibly can, uh, because basically that's why you hire us, uh, because we <laughs> take it completely unemotional and really try to look at everything with a cold eye to make the best decisions for you when it comes to investing your money. So in the spirit of doing this with a cold eye, keep that in mind as we you know, give our stats and break down you know, our thoughts here. It's as apolitical as possible. Um, we're completely agnostic here as we get into this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my screen and we're going to look at a little bit of market history and look how the market's done under different presidents. All right. So what we have here is from 1929 all the way to the present. And basically what you see is what the S&P 500 has done from 1921, excuse me, 1929 all the way to 2017. And you can see right underneath, you can see the different presidents that were basically in office over that time frame. And red obviously indicates if they were Republican, blue if they were Democrat. And if we start here with our recent president, Donald Trump, um, you can see that since his inauguration, which was November 8th, 2016. From election day. Excuse me, from election day, November 8th, 2016. Uh, $100 would have grown to $159 over his tenure. Now, GDP was down negative 2.5%. In all fairness to Donald, that had to do more with the pandemic um, than anything that happened to do with policy. In fact, if you take out the pandemic, uh, you know, GDP growth was somewhere around 23 to 2.5%, which is basically what the growth rate was for the prior presidency as well. So the market was up so far during Donald Trump's tenure. If you go back to President Obama, won $100 from his election day, if you're invested in, that was 11408 which is hard to believe. That's a long time ago now. Grew to $266. Average GDP growth was 1.6%. Uh, again, the market went up over his tenure as well. And if we keep going back here, let's go back to Bill Clinton, who's considered by some, it was the last time that we didn't have a deficit, I believe, Bob, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but the markets did very well. The economy did very well when Bill was in office. We had GDP growth of almost 4%, which is unheard of over the last decade. And $100 invested from his election day, which was 19, November of 1992, uh, grew to $386. Uh, the market, the economy did very well under Bill. And then if we go back to Reagan, another president that was considered one that brought us out of a great recession, Bob, you always tell me about how things were bad in the 70s and the 80s came along and Ronnie gave you a lot of hope. Well, GDP sure growth, did. what's that? Sure did. Sure did, you're smiling now. Um, three and a half percent GDP growth, not as good as Bill, but uh, I, I see why you had a lot of parties in the 80s, Bob, because uh, you know the <laughs> economy was growing. Now it makes sense. And $100 on his election day, which was 11 4 1980, uh, till the next election day would have grown to $285. Okay, so again, different presidents, different parties, and there's one trend here, and you can keep going back here if you look at this over history. You can see, Bob, I don't know, you know, look, you've been doing this a long time. You know, you've been studying the markets, and, you know, what trend do you see here if you're looking at this, uh, this chart? Well, as you can see, the stock market goes up on a perpendicular line. If you go from left to right, you know, the market is going up in, in all of our lifetimes. Uh, our parents' lifetimes, our grandparents' lifetime, our great-grandparents' lifetime. And there's a positive, as you can see, there's a positive correlation between the stock market going up and somebody, someone <laughs> sitting in the White House. Now, it doesn't matter who it is, it looks like. I mean, how could the economy grow better under Bill Clinton than under Ronald Reagan? Or was it maybe they didn't have anything to do with it or had something to do with it, but look how the economy has always grown our stock market's always grown, regardless of who's sitting in the White House. I think that's this this picture speaks, you know, loudly to me, and answers just about every question I've been asked by every client every day 
every five minutes about what this next election means. So what you're saying, now, Bob, the is- the problem is, yeah, I'm sorry, Ryan, go ahead. No, so what you're saying here, just to clarify is, there's high correlation with the market going up over time and having a president. <laughs> That's it. Got it. That's it. There's okay. a positive correlation to having someone sitting in the White House. Um, doesn't really matter what color they are, whether, you know, whether they're red or, or blue or, or we've never had anybody else but red or blue. So the problem is trying, you know, people are trying to time these things. Um, as Rice said, I've been doing this a long time. And if you go back and, you know, you, you try and, and game the election, no matter who it is, and we're, we're, we're always persuaded by how we feel about our politics. And it's really costly when it comes to investing, because here's a, here's a graph from this chart. This, this, this speaks volumes to me, the cost of timing the market, you know, because you got to be right. Now, this goes back 50 years from 1970, uh, just a little earlier before I got into the business. But if you, if you put $1,000 to work in 1970, it grew over 50 years to 121,000. So let's, let's, let's do it in numbers that we all understand. If we put $100,000 to work in 1970, you would have 12 million today. Now, if you missed the best performing day, now this is 50 years. So let's, you know, there, there's 365 days in a year, but the stock market's not open every day, right? It's only open certain days. So 50 years um, of the stock market being open, that's 12,500 days. Now, if you just miss the best day over that 12,500 days, your return drops a full 10%. So if you had 100,000 invested, you just gave up a million too. Now, if you missed the best five days, let's think of that, 12,500 days, you missed the best five days, right? Instead of having 12 million, you just missed out on 4.5 million. You, you, know, you basically gave up 4.5 million by missing the five best days. If you miss the best 15 days, right, your return is 60% less. So instead of making 12 million, you gave up 7.2 million on 100,000. Now, I'll tell you what, gang, I'm really good at this. I love the market. I study it all the time. I can't even tell you what the best day was over 50 years, let alone the best five or the best 15. Now, the counter argument is, well, Bob, I missed the worst five days, the worst 15 days, that would happen. Well. I can't predict the best days or the worst days, but again, markets go up on a perpendicular line from left to right. They don't go up every day, they don't go up every week or every month, or even every year. But you can see the trend is market always goes higher. And under every president, we've had new, new highs. Yeah, so basically, if you look at it from our perspective, and I think as an, as an investor, uh, this is a good time to go to some of the questions because this will speak about that market timing. Because again, if we think that the person and whoever that happens to be uh, is, going, is not going to get into office that we want to get into office, and we think that's going to be dire for the markets, and we're wrong. And in, even if the person we don't want to get in gets in and the market goes up, can you afford to miss that return over time? So that's what we grapple with all the time. And clearly, based on history, you know, it's, it's a big gamble trying to be in and out of the market, especially giving so many unknown variables when it comes to, we already know high correlation. I'm pretty sure we're going to have a president, Bob, come, you know, the, the election. It might be, might take a little while to get through, uh, you know, all the mail-in votes and everything else, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have an election. Some sort, we're going to have some sort of, I think we're going to have a president. The number one question we're getting every day from everyone is, you know, Bob, okay, if, um, you know, if the Biden administration gets in, we're going to become a socialist country, Taxes are going to go through the roof, you know, long-term capital gains be eliminated. Um, you know, corporate tax rates are going to go up 30%. And, you know, we don't know who's going to get in, right? So a lot of, I'm getting calls literally every minute of the day, Bob, let's get out and see and wait and see what happens. Because if we get out and, you know, the Biden administration gets in, then we can buy really low. And if, if not, if the incumbent, if, if President Trump stays in office, then we just get back in. You know, what do I miss out? Maybe a 1% move, 2%. Um, you know, who knows? It could be a 20% move. But so that's, that's what we call uncertainty, right? Number one, we don't know who's going to get elected. We don't know who's going to win the Senate. We don't know who's going to win the House. We don't know if that any administration gets in, what they can get passed, what they can't get passed. Um, 
But you know what, gang? We've been doing this for 100 years. Look at the last 100 years. Think about how much uncertainty we had over the last 100 years um, about who was getting in and what they were going to do once they were in. And look what the markets did in spite of all the uncertainty. So one of the things that, that we're not telling anybody to do is the market time. And our strategy is going to stay the same. We're going to stay with your targeted asset allocation. If the market declines because of whoever wins or loses, we're going to be buyers to reallocate back to your target, just like we were in the pandemic, you know, back in March of this year. So, you know, think about what's the worst case? What if the market drops? Well, drop 35% in five weeks. That happened this year, gang. We all survived and we're all, we all did better as a result of it because we've been able to rebalance and buy cheap. So that's really the primary question I'm getting, Rye. But what are some of the other more um, pointed questions that we have tonight? Sure. Let's go through them. So the first one comes in from Ted. And he puts in assumptions. If, the tr if Trump wins, stocks will rise quickly, then continue a sustained rally. If Biden wins, stocks will drop, but eventually and more slowly return and surpass current levels. We currently have little to no cash available to buy. Question, given the above, is the best move to sell some equities now, anticipating to buy low in December or January with a Biden win, therefore profiting, or we buy back ASAP after election day if Trump wins, in the later case, we'll have missed out on some profits, but we'll gain them back more quickly. So yeah, so I think this speaks to what Bob, you're just saying, is these are all assumptions, right? These are all assumptions. We have no idea how the market will actually react. Because the one thing about the market is, is whatever we believe now, and you know, Ted, respectful to you, you know, a lot of people believe the same thing, is probably already priced into the market, right? The market, if it's in the press, it's in the price. So we don't even know, and people forget this, but when Trump got in um, and the market did sell off heavily, now this was during the futures market before the market actually opened, and there's a, there a big belief that, well, this is completely unknown. This is somebody who's not a politician. Um, you know, Hillary Clinton was considered the one that was the status quo that was going to be bullish for markets. Trump was a wild card that'd be bearish for markets, markets like certainty. And as we just showed you, the markets went off to the races. Uh, by the end of... I believe that that election day, if I can recall correctly, markets had reversed and already started to go higher, um, just like that. And no one would have predicted ahead of time that's the reaction the market would have. So again, you know, just from a risk perspective, you know, if Biden gets in or if Trump continues, you know, another four years, we have no idea short term how that's going to affect the market. We have no idea. Right. I don't know if you realize this or not, but some of our clients are Democrats and some of our clients are Republicans and some of our clients are independents and libertarians. But, you know, they all call us and we talk to them all the time. And all my clients who were Democrats wanted me to sell everything when Trump got in. And all my clients are Republicans wanted me to sell everything when Obama got in. Um, but the best part was what he ran for his second term, all my conservative clients wanted me to sell everything because he might get in again. Now, I, I can, I'm looking at this graph, and in the first half of Obama's administration, the market went up. In the second half, it went up. And so far, Trump's administration, the market went up. I guess you could say that about every president. So again, you know, even if what your biggest fear is right now, just everybody think about their biggest fear politically, if it occurs, the market's not going to do what you expect. Because if everybody, what Ted's question was, you know, the assumption that Ted made, every single person I know is making the same assumption, everybody. And the market always prices in what everybody always thinks long before you can take action. So the market's smarter than all of us because there's, think about it, everybody, there's millions of people every day making decisions whether to buy or sell. Remember, the markets are auctions. And it, when there's a buyer, there's a seller. When there's a seller, there's a buyer. Price is determined by the millions of people making decisions every day. The market's already factored all these things in. So the market knows more than we do. And we'll only know in hindsight, you know, whether which one of these assumptions was right and what the reaction was from the market, whether it was correct or not. Which uh, fits right very nicely with our next question from Raymond, who says, thank you, Bob and Ryan, for taking my question. You're welcome, Raymond. If elected, do you think Vice President Biden will have a negative impact on the economy? I'm going to go flip a coin and see. No, in all seriousness, uh, we don't know. We don't know. But we do think that most likely, probably not, especially initially, because the one thing that we, we do see is bipartisan is politicians love to spend money. And the odds that if it's Biden or Trump in the, off, in, in the White House, 
you're probably going to see an infrastructure deal of some sort. You're probably going to continue to see more stimulus. And there's no coincidence back in you know, March when the market finally bottomed, it was the same week that the government approved the CARES Act, where trillions of dollars were pumped into the economy and instantaneously the market started to rally. So our belief is, whether it's Trump or Biden, and we believe that there's going to be a lot more stimulus happening. There's going to be more stimulus within the economy. And even if we see some tax hikes at some point, first off, you know, let's just assume Biden gets in and let's assume then we have to assume the Democrats take control of the Senate for any of these more extreme uh, tax measures to even pass. Then the question is, is that how many years does that take to actually pass? And secondly, what we know about politicians is they like to pivot. Once they're in office, in fact, Democrats tend to do better. Inaugural Democratic president in their first year, the Marxists tend to do better than a Republican because whatever fears that anyone uh, conceived that, the, that a Democratic candidate was going to have, they don't actually transpire. They actually dial back the more aggressive policies. So the guess is probably whether it's Trump or Biden in there, um, and given the fact that we have so much stimulus, it's not just in the U.S. gang. You know, we have trillions of dollars being printed worldwide right now as every global economy is recovering. And the U.S. economy is recovering too. I suspect, Bob, that's a greater force than who's sitting in the White House you know, come next January. Yeah, actually, great points, Ryan. And, and it just points to how much uncertainty it is. But I think the real question on everybody's mind is, well, you know, if there is a buying opportunity, right? If the market does hit into it at an abyss, um, how do we take advantage of it? Well, the same thing we did and we always recommend in the past is re, you rebalance your portfolio and you don't have to have cash in your portfolio to rebalance because remember our bonds are the highest quality bonds you can own, whether they're municipal bonds or taxable bonds and they're totally liquid. In other words, you, we, can, we can liquidate your whole bond portfolio and email you a check or you know, wire a check to you or wire the cash to you today. You know, that's, how, that's how liquid the portfolios are. So if we do get you know, an opportunity, remember, the, the stock market is not about buying low and selling high. It's about you know, appreciation over time, but half the return comes from the dividends that are being paid. And right now we're getting better dividends from our portfolio than we are from our interest from our bond portfolio. So we're, we have plenty of liquidity in every one of your portfolios to take advantage of whatever occurs. So don't think about you have to be sitting in cash. Remember, cash is paying you zero right now. In your bond portfolios, you would create interest every day. Every day you make money in your bond portfolio, every day. That interest is yours. And your dividends pay every quarter. We just got big dividend checks, you know, at the end of uh, last month. So, you know, we're going to rebalance by staying fully invested in your target. If the, if the market gives us opportunity, and that's what volatility is, it's opportunity because when was there a permanent dip on this chart, right? Where do you see a permanent dip in the stock market over the last 100 years? Oh, you don't know it's coming next. No one told you? Okay. This time it's, it's coming next. Problem. <laughs> so all dips are temporary and new highs are inevitable. So with an allocated approach, you guys have the, the best the best opportunity out there because you know you don't have all your money in the S and P or all your money in Apple or all your money, you know, in Medtronics. You have your money diversified over ten thousand stocks and you own bonds that are totally liquid and come due. Yeah, and kind of actually fits in perfectly with that. The next question from Rocco comes in is it's likely that we will not have Final election results for weeks. It's very possible. There's about 80 million uh, mail-in votes this time around. Given that the market hates uncertainty, wouldn't it be smart to divest on November 3rd and buy back after things settle down? Or the Dems take the President of the United States and the Senate, all taxes will go up, especially business tax. This will have a major neg negative impact for one year's plus. Uh, smart to sell. So I think this plays into just what we said before. And there's one thing I want to say, I do want to mention about this is given that the market hates uncertainty. Okay. And what that means is the market tends to trade lower when things are uncertain. And conversely, Bob and I, we love uncertainty. Bob and I, we go to bed every night dreaming that things aren't certain because once things are certain, and I can assure you after November 3rd, they're going to be a lot more certain than they are today. Markets tend to trade higher. You know, when we feel the most confident, and everything's as rosy as it can possibly be, you miss the opportunity. So you know, one thing we look at right now, going back to rebalancing, you know, we can take money from bonds and add to stocks, is these opportunities when things are uncertain, that's the best time to be adding to your stock portfolio, period. 
Right now you're getting a gift from the gods. And what Bob just said is, you know, also what's your alternative? Um, you know, if you look at our stock portfolios now, you know, we're getting three, four percent dividends. Some parts of our portfolio pay like seven, eight percent right now. You just can't replicate that sitting in cash. Your opportunity cost in cash now is probably the greatest it's ever been in our career. I don't remember a time when our equity portfolio, our stock portfolios were paying more than our bonds. In some cases, seven, eight hundred percent more than our cash. So, you know, it's really more than ever, especially if you're trying to build your portfolio for retirement, live off of it. You need that income and that income doesn't turn off just because there's an election around the corner. <laughs> so now, That's a good point, right? Because, you know, that the strategy is the discipline, right? So you take a look at um, you take a look at what happened in, in March this year with this the pandemic, global pandemic hit stock market dropped 35 percent in five weeks. And, you know, this is the most amount of money we've ever managed. I've been doing this for 45 years. The largest paying capital has ever been, largest our family business has ever been. And we had the least amount of people ever since I've been an advisor since 1975 that panicked out in March. So out of 2,000 households, maybe four people, maybe four panicked. Um, and the, th the amazing thing was the day that you mostly, that you want to panic when that market hit its bottom in March, in three days, three days, the market was up 18%. So, you know, when I think of people wanting to time this election because the uncertainty, uncertainty, think about when you were certain, there's four people that were certain that it was over in March. And, and all of a sudden they said, oh, well, I'll get out. I'll get back in when things feel better. Well, did it feel better missing out on an 18% move? I know I wouldn't have felt so good. <laughs> but anyway, that's where market timing is so hard. It's so hard because we only panic after the damage is done. And it's really hard to panic back in when the opportunity is the greatest. Yeah, and usually what happens is when we finally get back in, it's, it's, the market's already risen. And you know, missing those, those moves, as Bob showed you before, is treacherous to your financial health. Uh, the next question that comes in from Steve, if Biden wins, I think I know where a lot of people stand here, <laughs> their political beliefs, and, and he, he moves ahead with this tax increase, what happens to the stock market over his term? Well, first off, I do want to speak about this a little bit. There's a lot of talk about capital gains going up. And if they do, if let's say Biden gets in, you're going to get a lot of people selling their stock before the end of the year. That's a great narrative. And it sounds really good. But what I think we have to realize is over 70% of all the market is controlled by institutional investors. It's not retail investors like you and I. And institutions are not subject to capital gains tax. So, and if you look at it, Historically, in the 80s, you had an increase in cap gains rates. There's no empirical evidence, actually, that it affected stock prices negatively, believe it or not. Believe it or not. So, you know, in terms of that, with institutions really driving the market action, it's highly unlikely that you get a big sell off at the end of the year. Because the other thing is people need income. You know, even if capital gains went up, why would you sell your positions that you're earning a lot more and sit in cash earning nothing? So, again, a lot of that is opportunity cost. You know, there's a, there's a saying out there called Tina that you might hear. There is no alternative. You know, Bob and I subscribe to that right now. If you look at the alternatives right now to the high dividend payouts that you can get on equities, um, even some real estate versus what you get in bonds and cash right now, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's almost like penny wise dollar foolish if we think capital gains rates are going up and even sell here. So this is something to keep in mind because I know there's a lot of fear about those taxes. The other thing I'll mention there too is since we've been in a pandemic, um, a lot of companies that are really relying on the economy to reopen have gotten so good at managing their expenses that the operating leverage that they're going to have as the economy reopens is going to be tremendous. They can do less revenue and have higher earnings. So even if taxes go up, you have to remember companies are getting leaner and meaner than they ever were before because of the pandemic. And it's just another reason why we're very bullish right now with the reopening of the economy is we think a surprise and the positive too is the fact that companies have just gotten so good at managing their balance sheet. So just some things to think about when you think about the tax perspective. Uh, anything to add there, Bob, before I go to the next question? No, well said, Roy. All right. I can't argue with you. Carlton writes in, uh, wouldn't having a specific strategy for the election be, being try, uh, ugh, election be trying to time the market? <laughs> We always try to time the market by, by investing your dividends and interest into where the greatest opportunity is at all times. So absolutely right. We're not market timers. We're investors. 
and we're investors who take advantage of dislocations in the market. So if we do get a big dramatic drop in the stock market at some point in the next one, five, 10 or 50 years, we'll sell some bonds and take advantage of it. Or the inverse is true. If, if the bond market prevents it, presents an opportunity, we'll sell stocks and take advantage of it. So, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna sit in cash at a zero return to take advantage of you not making any money. Well, I think the other way to answer this question, because I think uh, Carlton's trying to be a little bit clever here, is the reality of is, no, we don't have a specific strategy for the election. It's the strategy we always have based on your goals and your dreams. <laughs> so, right. right so our, right. our strategy doesn't change because of the election. It's the same one that we would deploy regularly. But I think the way our, we titled this, uh, this call was, uh, you know, specifically for the election. But the point here is you want to keep with the status quo. So I got that. I caught that, Carly. Uh, next question comes in from Shelly. Bob and Ryan, I live in California. I've been wanting to buy property to move my business to currently renting. But if Prop 15 passes, there's a possibility that the property taxes could triple. Should I wait and see or take the plunge? I'm not that well versed. I know Prop 15 is about potentially raising those real estate taxes. You probably want to talk to someone in California has a better idea of where that's going to go. I don't think I can speak intelligently on that, Bob. I feel like you're probably in the same boat on that. The only thing I can talk about there, Rye, is that uh, the housing market's booming. I, you know, I'm in Ocean City, New Jersey. Everything of us for sales has been sold. Um, some of you are some of our clients in North Carolina. They tell me everything goes on the market, sells in two days in Florida. It's been a, an amazing. We have, we have home builders as clients. They've, the best year they've ever had, ever this year. And so I think, you know, here's, the, here's the, I think what's happening now, we have Jerome Powell as our Federal Reserve Chairman. And I think Jerome Powell will continue to be the Federal Reserve Chairman, regardless of who sits in the White House. And he's already pledged to keep interest rates lower for longer. He's buying back bonds. He's, you know, backstopping the, the financial markets. And we have a Fed put, so to speak. So, you know, I think what the market's going to react to the best is the economy. And the economy has been in a V-shaped recovery. And we're seeing, you know, the housing market, that's, that's one of the best drivers of economic growth you could possibly have. And then we have, you know, these vaccines that are coming. Uh, you know, uh, we've had some good news on vaccines. We're talking about distributing a vaccine by the end of November, possibly. Um, so there's parts of the economy that are still closed. So if that opens, reopens, like I think it will, uh, suddenly people are going to casinos again, they're flying, they're, you know, they're taking cruises. This, this, is gonna, this economy is going to explode. Um, so I think it's more important where the Federal Reserve chairman is still in place as opposed to the president right now. Jay Powell, got to love him, Bob. Got to love him. I do. I got a picture of him on my desk, right? <laughs> I don't believe that, but uh... <laughs> yeah, well, I might get one after this call. <laughs> Next question comes in from Barry. He writes in, short of selling off securities. All right, Barry, you're my man. We're not selling stock here. You're with us. What is the best way to hedge your bet in case of a steep downturn? Well, this goes back to, again, sticking to your strategy and discipline. That's what pain capital management is all about. That's why we run diversified portfolios. And this brings up a good point. Just because, let's say, the presidential candidate that you like doesn't get in, the one that gets in you think is going to have a detrimental effect on the U.S. economy, well, that might not necessarily have the same effect on what happens in Europe or what happens in China, which is completely for the most part, insulated from our economy in a lot of ways. So by having that diversified portfolio, that's always a question that Bob and I ask is, well, what market's going to get affected? You know, if you have a portfolio with us of paying capital management, you have commodity exposure, which has been doing extremely well since governments have those printing presses on. That's been very good for physical assets. You know, real estate in your portfolios, we have small caps, which had a huge move in the last two weeks as the economy has started to reopen. So, you know, that's the whole idea of diversification is, you know, I always say you don't want to have an all or none portfolio. You want to have a portfolio that account for lots of different situations. And if you have all your ducks in line, you have everything covered, no matter what happens, you should have something in your portfolio that works. Yeah, I have to agree with that, right? Uh, you know, I've been through a lot of presidential elections, a lot of cycles, um, and Every election has always been the most important election of our lifetime. And I think that's probably always going to be true. But, you know, two weeks up to an election, everybody's hair is on fire. Uh, the media stirs the pot. 
and literally the day after every election that I've ever watched while I've been in a financial advisor, the next day it's crickets. It's like, all right, it's over. Life moves on. Um, I, actually, I just talked to the chairman of, of Apple and he said, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to sell any, any iPhones next year. It depends on who wins. No, he actually didn't say that. The fact of the matter is business is going to continue. And, you know, the day after the election, when, when, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, the business of America is business. And, you know, it's the greatest country in the world. And our economy always grows because you have the greatest entrepreneurs in the world. And entrepreneurs are not going to stop being entrepreneurs or business owners or people in business are not going to stop doing business because their political person didn't win. Um, Warren Buffett always says, I've never made an investment decision based on sits in the White House. And I don't think it's going to be any different uh, on November 4th. So Bob, for the record, on November 4th, I can expect you to show up to the, the office and clock in regardless. Yep. Okay. And, uh, and there will be crickets. <laughs> Next question comes in. We're done down the home stretch here is from John. He writes, what bond markets do you like? Well, if you're a client of our firm, we like high quality bonds that you own that are institutionally managed because we don't want to have the risk of a bond fund. And if you've been a client of our firm, you know, we don't like bond funds because A, they don't come due. And the whole idea of the bond portfolio, the bond component of your portfolio is for safety. Again, if the market goes down, is what happens during the election. We have plenty of bonds we can sell, but also quality is a really, really key component. If you own a bond fund here, they own a lot of what we call junk bonds. They use the euphemism high yield bonds, but they're junk. They're very, very low quality. And you don't want to have that in your portfolio, specifically if you're building this portfolio for safety and retirement, you don't want to own junk in your portfolio. And right now, you know, if you have an actively managed portfolio like we do, they're very strategic. So if interest rates start to go up, which they actually have started to go up in the last couple of weeks, surprisingly, you know, they're going to actually start to buy longer term bonds, start to extend on the curve. If rates stay low, they'll go in a little bit shorter. So, you know, having an institutional manager where you own the bond, someone's doing credit work, and they're going to manage it based on what happens with interest rates, we found is the most successful strategy that we've used now for, for several decades. Especially with municipal bonds. Uh, a lot of municipalities are in trouble. A lot of, uh, you know, a lot of big cities are having problems. You've got to own the right municipal bonds. You just can't own a municipal bond. If you're in a municipal bond fund, you know, they charge a lot of internal fees. They got to make up for those fees by reaching for yield. Um, you don't want to, you don't want to be in anything that you don't understand or they, you know, that has that kind of risk. You want to make sure you have a high quality bonds that are being watched every single day. Yes, which brings us to our final question. Actually, we did get a question over in the chat from uh, Alyssa. I think I'm pronouncing him correctly. And I will go through, it looks like there are a couple questions here, but why don't we just go with, um, okay, so I don't believe we're, we've ever had such far left Dem candidates. And I would think their philosophy would impact trade, corporate profits, et cetera, negatively. Um, and I think again, yeah, I think this just comes back to, yes, they could, they could, maybe. But are we, are we willing to bet, again, going back to what Bob said, um, you know, your entire net worth on, on getting into cash and waiting and seeing and missing a move in the market that you don't get back, you basically lose your return in stocks for the next decade uh, over a policy that may or may not happen. Meanwhile, I'm confident Bob's going to come to work on November 4th. Um, and, and I'm confident that we're all going to figure out a way to feed our families, figure out how to do business. That's kind of like, kind of inbred, I think, in the American way of life. Um, and I think that's going to continue. I mean, I, I don't think that philosophy is changing just because of what's happening in Capitol Hill. And if anything, you know, Bob, and I don't want to speak for you. I'm more optimistic than ever. You know, I love the way the economy has recovered. There was no strategist or economist on Wall Street that projected that our recovery would be this fast. Now, Bob and I did, if you remember back in April, but, you know, I digress. But yeah. most people on Wall Street have not. Um, and we're seeing it. So I think we have to think about here is, above and beyond potential tax increases, above and beyond the bureaucracy of what happens in Capitol Hill, there's more risk right now being out of the market than being in the market with all that cash that's been printed, the economic recovery, you know, these pharmaceutical cocktails and vaccines that may work very, very soon. These, are, these can all be catalysts to melt the market up. And if you miss that melt up again, gang, not to reiterate, but you know, that, there's all your return in stock for the next decade. Yeah, I think um, 
you know, do you have any other questions, Rai? I have one more came in from a candy. I feel like that's not a real name. And Candy writes in, I have been in admiration of Bob's hair for years. <laughs> Can you share with us what his daily regimen is and what, what products he uses from shampoo to conditioner and styling? How does he not ever have one hair out of place? <laughs> I think I know what I climate. Right? My father, he used to um, use dial soap as his shampoo. So he was a very basic man. That's all it takes. <laughs> so I think in summary, Rye, what we can say is when you look at, look at this chart, you know, look at this stock market over the last hundred years. And the one thing that I believe in is this, is, you know, time passes and markets operate and neither cares what anyone's political beliefs are, neither cares, you know, who sits in the White House or who's, you know, dominating the politics at the time. You know, we've had, you know, both, you know, administrations from both parties and the market moves relentlessly higher. You know, today, right now, as we speak, we're the wealthiest we've ever been as a country, right? We have, you know, when you look at the average wealth with your real estate and your, your portfolios, um, the, you know, right now, our country is worth more than it's ever been worth over that 100-year period. So my guess is markets will continue to operate, time will pass, and, you know, we need to get the returns that the markets so generously give over time by being investors. So my recommendation is stay the course. We're going to rebalance if we have to. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to react to what happens in the market. We're not going to anticipate because no one can predict what's unpredictable. No one can know what's unknowable, no matter, you know, how much they try to sell you that swamp land in Florida. Well said, Bob. Thank you, Rock. Um, and I'm interested in that swap plan. So maybe we can talk after this call. Um, listen, guys, thank you very much for uh, jumping on the call. We're about 40 minutes in, so we don't want to take up all of your night. Um, but hopefully that was helpful. And hopefully, you know, you get a gist of what our strategy is here. And it's our, it's always our strategy, Carly, um, is, you know, basically, look, let's stick to following what your goals are, getting you to your goals. That's much more important than any event driven strategy, like what's going on at the election right now. Um, and bottom line is, you know, look, keep your eye on the prize and uh, that's sticking to a diversified asset allocation. That's what's gotten us through decades since Bob developed this back in the late 80s. And, uh, you know, odds are it's going to work again. So thank you all. Have a great night and hope to see everybody soon.